Hey, Walter Sorrell's back with another Knife Makers Friday Five. Today, Hamones, a couple of questions about Japanese swords, and we'll make a cool little tool that's very useful and ultra simple to make. Today, I'll mostly be answering questions related to Japanese swords. First, I'll talk about sharpening Japanese swords. Then, I'll also show how I make a little sanding block that I use for sanding curved surfaces on some of my swords. And finally, I'll talk hamones and steel. What kind of steel you need to use to get a decent hamone. So, I recently had a viewer contact me uh, who's a martial artist has a Japanese sword that uh, has gotten a little dinged up as he's been using it for tomeshigiri test cutting and uh, wanted some tips about how to sharpen it. So to begin with, the key point is that you need to understand the difference between Japanese swords and the conventional Western type knives that we would normally be sharpening. Here's an example of one of my tactics armory blades and you can see that like most normal Western knives, there's the large bevel that makes it a knife rather than a crowbar, and then there's this tiny little bevel here on the edge, and that's what actually makes it sharp. So typically, the main bevel comes down to a thickness of, you know, it could be anywhere from 10 to 30 thousandths of an inch, maybe even a little bit bigger than that on some giant chopper or something, about half a millimeter. And then, a slightly less acute angle is formed, and that's what you actually sharpen. With a Japanese blade, like a katana, the blade has a tiny bit of convex curvature and it goes all the way down to zero with no secondary bevel or micro bevel. So how do you go about sharpening that without either scratching the crap out of the blade or forming a secondary bevel? The short answer is very carefully. In all seriousness though, the first thing is having the right tool. Of course, you could use a natural stone or whatever, just like they did a thousand years ago. But what I use is one of these Easy Lap Diamond Stones. There are some other brands that are kind of similar, but these are really cheap and they move a lot of metal fast. You will not get extra bonus points in heaven for taking forever to sharpen things. It's just time taken out of your life. So my philosophy on sharpening is to do it as fast as you can and still do a good job. I always use the extra fine grade. To me, the heavier cutting ones don't give you as keen an edge. So what you're trying to do is to find the exact angle of the blade and then go just the tiniest bit further. So imagine this little piece of wood is the cross section of a blade. If this is the angle of the blade at the edge, then the angle you want to sharpen is just beyond it, like so. So you would think this would form a micro bevel. And in fact, it does, but it's a very, very tiny one. On the other hand, if you stick exactly with the angle of the blade as it currently exists, because it's very, very subtly convex, you'll end up scratching the blade pretty badly. Typically, we think about sharpening up towards the spine, but what I'm doing is running it down the edge of the blade parallel to that edge, just a few strokes. Assuming that the blade's still reasonably sharp, you can do this amazingly quickly. Okay, but what if there's so much wear to the edge that just kind of tuning up that edge won't hack it? Well, unfortunately with Japanese swords, that means that it's time for a complete repolish, uh, which could cost a few thousand bucks if you have it done by a traditional Japanese sword polisher. Okay, so let's turn to a minor problem in making various blades, including Japanese swords. So the spine of a Japanese sword has an interior curve. In other words, it's curved away from the edge. And that means that when you sand it or grind it, you have to use a crown stone or something of that nature, something that's curved. Otherwise, it won't match that curve and uh, it'll bite into the edge and you'll just get it all gouged up and it just doesn't work very well. So let's make a little sanding block that will conform to interior curves. Very simple to make. I'll be using a piece of HDPE plastic. Same stuff they use for cutting boards. It's got a million uses in my shop and I always keep a lot of it on hand. But you could do something like this with soft wood like pine or spruce. It'll work just fine. So I'll set up this little block here in the slot of my cutting guide on my bandsaw so that I cut all the slots exactly the same depth. Then I'll just cut a little slot about every 
quarter of an inch, eighth of an inch, whatever, just like so. And when we're done, it'll flex. Now, I cut it the first time and it wasn't quite deep enough, so I reset that stop a little bit, cut it one more time, and now it's exactly as flexible as I want it. So there we go, very simple to use, very simple to make. I just fold the sandpaper into the little slots on the ends, and then you can either hold it on with finger pressure or you can get fancier and stick pins in it, or you can even make little clips. But I find that the pressure of your fingers is usually enough to keep it nice and steady. Last thing, I'm gonna talk a little about steel and Japanese swords. By the way, this is potentially of interest to anybody who makes hamones, not just Japanese sword enthusiasts. So, I got a question recently from a viewer who wants to make a katana, and he wanted a misty or cloudy rather than a sort of hard-edged hamon. So let's back up before we address his actual question and talk a little bit about the relationship between hamones and steel. Of course, hamones have gotten very popular in recent years in Western knife making. The hamone is this wiggly line that runs down the edge of Japanese swords. But now people put them on bowie knives and pocket knives and all kinds of things. Some people think that hamones are just some kind of decorative thing that you can just sort of etch on there or something, but that's not it at all. So, a uh, footnote here, if you're interested in digging a little deeper into this whole Hamon issue, I've got a very in-depth video available on my website, waltersorrelsblades.com. You can find that in the description, where you can take a really deep dive into the subject. Incidentally, that was the very first video that I ever made and really got me rolling on this whole thing. So, Hamones are something that have been really interesting to me for a very long time, something that I've, I've really uh, kind of specialized in. So anyway, the traditional hamon was made on swords that were forged from tamahagane, which is basically a very simple carbon steel. Roughly 1% carbon, you know, give or take, and roughly 99% uh, iron. So tamahagane is very hot, uh, shallow hardening, meaning that it has to be cooled extremely quickly in order to harden. So when the ancient smiths coated the spine of the blade with clay before quenching, it kept out all that heat in there and kept that part of the blade from hardening. So the edge hardens, but the spine doesn't. And uh, the hamon is sort of the artifact of that process. It's the visual marker that allows you to see what actually happened metallurgically. So if you're using modern steel to make a hamon, what do you need? The key point here is that you need a steel that's as close to that traditional tamahagane as possible. Uh, and the you know, most standard sort of analog to that ancient type of steel is uh, the 10 series of high carbon steels. This would be 1050 steel, 1075, 1095 that a lot of people have heard of. So here's the tricky issue. All modern steels, unlike Tamahagane, or for that matter, steel that might have been made in Western Europe 500 years ago, uh, contains manganese. And manganese is an extremely powerful hardening inducer, meaning that just a little tiny bit of manganese makes it much easier to harden the steel. The slower that you can quench a steel and have it still harden, the more difficult it is to produce a hamon because the whole blade obviously wants to harden. What this means in practice is that even some 10 series steels really stink for making hamones. 1084 and 1065, for instance, often contain a little more manganese than many of the other 10 series steels, which means that you're in for a lot of heartache if you try to make a hamone with them. Not saying it can't be done, just that as little as a quarter of a percent more manganese can totally be the difference between an interesting and complex and detailed hamone and just a real blah hamone, or no hamone at all. So when you buy steel, uh, most steel vendors will actually offer you a little a data sheet or a, a assay sheet, I forget what they typically call it, but it basically has the actual melt that that particular batch of steel was made from. It's got all the chemistry data so that you know exactly and precisely how much manganese there is, how much iron, how much carbon, and so on. Um, it's very handy to have this, um, and they don't necessarily send it to you unless you ask. 
But anyway, I prefer steel that has no more than 0.25% manganese. That's one quarter of 1%. Will 0.3% work? Yes, but the more that it creeps up past that, say up to 0.5%, half a percent of carbon, the more problems you'll have, the more kind of blah your, your hormones will be, and the more trouble that you'll have getting really tight control over what they do. So let me jump back to my viewer's question about producing a misty hormone as opposed to something that's a little harder edged. If you use a higher manganese type of steel, O1 uh, would be a typical one that's very close to high carbon steels but has higher levels of manganese. Uh, 5160 is another possibility. Uh, you can get a hormone if you're really careful. Um, and they'll come out really cloudy and soft edge. But personally, this is just to my eye, I don't think they look all that great. I've seen some people who've done pretty interesting things with some of those steels, but my own experience with them hadn't been very good. Uh, but hey, if that's what you're looking for, if you want misty, it is possible to do it that way. Bottom line, you can make quite close analogs to traditional hormones, but you got to have the right steel to do it. Thanks for watching guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!